If you're still with me as I walk through H. Richard Niebuhr's Christ and Culture, first, thank you. I know this is a bit of a slog, but it's the only way I know to continue producing daily devotionals while at the same time preparing to teach a course at our seminary in Pakistan in late October, all the while doing regular ministry at the church. I promise that when we're done with this, I'll return to less academic stuff. Hello, I'm Stuart Baskin, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Tyler, Texas, and this is your daily devotional for Tuesday, June 18th, 2024. Today, I want to begin talking about Niebuhr's famous typology of churches. Recall that a typology is just a handy way to make sense of the world around us. It's not like a taxonomy that represents an objective analysis of physical reality. Instead, a typology is by nature somewhat subjective. It is an analysis not of physical things, but of social phenomena. And so social phenomena are always subject to interpretation. Niebuhr's typology is pretty specific in its aim. He's looking specifically at how different wings of the church have navigated the Christ culture problem, or what he calls the enduring problem. As he, as he defines it, the problem revolves around the question of how we navigate our loyalty to Jesus Christ on the one hand, and the many people and institutions in the broader culture to which we owe allegiance. Niebuhr's study begins with the simple observation that throughout Christian history, there has never emerged one single final answer to this problem. Instead, he sees five different typical answers that have taken shape throughout the long history of the church. The first of these answers seems pretty logical. Niebuhr calls it the Christ against culture position. As its name suggests, followers of this idea reject any allegiances that could in any way compete with a Christian's loyalty to Jesus Christ. And while this seems appealing, the way it works out in actual practice will strike many of us as strange. People can say they stand within this position, but they really don't. Which begs the obvious question, what is the Christ against culture position? What does it look like? Who actually practices it? This position is represented primarily by religious sects that withdraw from the broader culture as much as possible. In our day, the Amish and the Mennonites are the ones who most clearly represent this type. Their focus is on the community of faith apart from the world. The epistle we know as 1 John most clearly articulates this position in Scripture. The writer of the epistle contrasts the church with the world in such stark terms that it is clear one can participate either in the church or in the world, but not in both. He writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride and riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. In other words, you can either participate in the life of the world or you can be a Christian, not both. Wealth building, out. Social status, meaningless. Enjoyment of fine food, hmm, not so much. Military service, only in a non-combatant role at most. Political participation, none. Why? Because the world out there is hopelessly lost and to participate it, in it is to participate in the realm of darkness. Want to change the world? This is not the group to lean on. Their answer is to withdraw from the world as much as possible. It's not just that some particular cultures are evil. Culture itself is evil, regardless of which culture it's in. This is not the same thing as contemporary Christian movements that want to change our culture through political means. This is a wholesale rejection of culture itself. Instead, Christian life centers on absolute faith in Jesus Christ and love for one's fellow believers. Again, we read in 1 John, this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him and he abides in them. 
And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. This, in turn, leads into the famous passage on love from 1 John 4. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. He continues, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. When many of us read this today, we often think of love in general, including love for the world. But the writer of 1 John is clear that this love is the love only of fellow believers for one another. So that's what the Christ against culture type looks like. Tomorrow, let's take a look under the hood, so to speak, to see what drives this type. But for now, may God continue to bless you and keep you in all that you do this day and in all the days ahead.